What's up everyone? I've had a ton of requests for a deep dive video into my mixing workflow. I've heard you, we're gonna do it. I'm an engineer that has specialized into the types of techniques that are needed to be able to work with bass heavy, modern genres like electronic music and hip hop. And I'll tell you, there are a whole host of very specific techniques that work with those genres you might not know about. In this video, I'm going to peel back the onion and reveal all of the tools that I use, the processes that I employ, and all of the best practices in a real project. I have a project that is most of the way through the mixing process, and I'm gonna show you track by track exactly how I got that sound. Let's listen to a little preview of the song. There it is. So we're gonna dive into this project. I'm gonna show you track by track, all of the effects, all of the tools that I'm using, all of the settings, all of the routings, all of the secret sauce techniques, best practices. I'm not gonna hold anything back. I really want to equip you to understand my current up-to-date modern mixing workflow. So let's get into the video and I'll see you there. So what we're gonna do is start from the bottom and work our way up and I'll just go track by track. So we're gonna start with this uh, 808 sub. And I will mention that because this video is gonna be quite extensive because I'm showing the entire mix, I did put timeline tags, chapters in the video. So you can take a look at those. And if you wanna skip ahead to something, if you don't wanna watch the video in a linear fashion, be my guest. But yeah, we're gonna start with the 808 because it's holding down the lowest frequencies in the song. Here it is on solo. I kind of like to sum it with the kick because in this case, I'm ducking the 808 to the kick. There's two ways you can create an 808. One is you, because it was originally a kick drum synthesizer, right? You can use the front end pitch envelope of the 808 itself, which I chose not to do. Or you can duck the 808 and have a kick drum that you've designed separately take up the front, but they're perceived as a single thing together. And so I really wanted to design my own kick and transient and all that stuff. So here's what they sound like summed. Yeah, so that sounds much better to me together. Uh, so I'll leave the kick in for now. And let's go through the, the processing on the, uh, on the 808. I'm just gonna go ahead and deactivate all of the effects. That's what it sounds like straight out of Serum. So I use Serum for this. And I'm not gonna cover the sound design in Serum because I've covered that just recently in a different video. So I'll drop a link and a card to that one. It's called The Art of Modern Sub where I show exactly how I created the bass 808 for this song. And I'll also drop a link to the companion video that goes with that called The Science of Modern Sub. That was a big video I did recently that got a lot of traction. And it was talking about the theories, the psychoacoustics, the sound design in creating sub that translates really well on both big systems and small speakers. Okay, so the first thing we have here is a Sound Toys effect rack. And... Um, just wanted to give a shout out to Sound Toys. They recently hooked me up with their full bundle, the Sound Toys 5 bundle. And I've been using it because they're, they're hyper creative effects. And uh, they asked me to demo this inside of a, a project. And so you'll see a lot of Sound Toys uh, devices through this project. Uh, I'm really happy with how things turned out. And so I'll just show you what I'm using. I, I used a whole bunch of other plugins in this project too. So it's not exclusively a, a, a Sound Toys uh, tutorial but uh, I am using their stuff really heavily and uh, you can hear for yourself the difference that it makes, okay? So this is a, a analog-ish color character EQ uh, called PsyQ and uh, I really dig it. And I've put it in their effect rack and you'll see me using these a lot through the project. 
And uh, Ableton Live users, of course, are going to be like, well, I have audio effect racks, right? Well, not every DAW has that. And the effect rack is nice because you can just see all of your SoundToys plugins. You can drag them in. And then you have things like uh, your mix and input and output, uh, even a recycle where you can actually do a feedback loop back into the front of the rack, which is a really neat feature. And uh, yeah, so, so here it is without the PsyQ. And with. Okay, so I'm using it to, to pump up the low end. And this just gives a really nice kind of bell, low bell filter uh, centered at around the 20 hertz. So it's really uber low end. It just gives the 808 some, some girth down there. And you can see uh, I'm running it and I have mixed control over that. Next up, we're doing a little bit of uh, EQ shaping with the Pro-Q3. And one of the kind of pro techniques that I talked about in my Science of Modern Sub video is should you EQ your sub? in the base of your song? And if so, how? And uh, what you're seeing me do here is a reflection of a lot of the guidance that was given by my colleague Ryan Schwab, who's a multiple uh, Grammy-nominated engineer, mix and mastering engineer, multi-platinum engineer. And uh, he had a great process where he talked about right-sizing the bass. And I've kind of employed a lot of Ryan's guidance here with this. You can just see some nice, gentle shaping, taking some top out with a shelf, some bottom out with a shelf. And, um, and I'm doing a little bit of attenuation in the uh, upper octaves and then i'm just giving using a little bit of a dynamic uh boost just in the mid channel there we go so let's listen without and with now the 808 sounding a little different than it should it's sounding distorted and that's because downstream i have these gain plugins so i'm just going to turn this on Okay. Managing gain through the project is a really key part. You need to be managing how much gain you're pushing into different plugins, especially if that plugin is doing saturation or some type of gain reduction duty that's sensitive to the input level. Okay. So you need to be, you'll see me using utility plugins all through my process just to nudge gain around and manage the gain structure into the different plugins I have in my chain. Okay. So those are just some EQ. The most significant plugin in the chain is the Isotope Trash 2. I use this all the time on basses. And uh, the first thing is I'm using a little bit of saturation just on the bottom band. So I put it into multiband and there's nothing happening on the upper two bands, but on the bottom band, you can see I am pushing some drive and uh, let's listen to that without and with. Nice. Okay. Um, that little squelchy thing that you heard, by the way, is coming from the drums, and we're going to get to that later. So that uh, <laughs> sounds, sounds weird with it, but uh, it's not part of the bass. Okay, now the next thing is, uh, and I will take the kick off for this, is the Convolve. And this is in the area here. You have a bunch of different options, and the Convolver is, uh, it has an impulse response that is loaded into it, a bunch of impulse responses. And it's giving, rather than having a, a convolution reverb this is not a convolution reverb these are very short ambiences that are really more towards the early reflection so they give space they give a sense of acoustic space and a beautiful 3d uh, sensation around sounds and you can you have a lot of control here and so in the tones area there's this one called big bottom and uh, you can see I have it tailored in 8% mix. Um, I'm, I'm narrowing it a bit. So I, I'm attenuating the side channel and because yeah, it is um, uh, an effect that will give a bit of um, width around something. So uh, here it is without. Now, the key with this is to just use a touch. Now, you can really hear what the effect is doing if I push it up, but it's going to sound rubbish. You can see it's just introducing too much width. I do want a little bit of width around the 808. That's completely fine. And I just want a touch in the mix, okay? So let's take a look at that. Yeah. Now, for those of you that are like, oh my God, you're putting stereo width in your low end. I thought your low end has to be mono. I'm gonna give you two threads to pull on one of them. 
is a video that I did that addresses this in depth. And it says, is mono base destroying your low end? There's a link below in the description and up in the cards where I kind of dissected and really disproved the myth that top producers and engineers in bass music and electronic and hip hop genres are monoing the low end. They are not. Okay. So um, just to quickly prove that, I have four references here. One from Childish Gambino, okay, Sweatpants, Suicide Boys, Carrollton, Mr. Carmack, Money, a, a huge trap track, and Skrillex Rumble, which won the 2024 Grammy for Best Electronic Slash Dance Recording. Okay, so these are the biggest songs in the industry. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to load up a plugin that shows you mid and side channel information, and I will solo the songs, okay? I'm going to have to suppress the audio for copyright reasons so you won't hear it. But uh, look at this. Okay, white is side information and blue is mid information, okay? There you go, 80 hertz, a lot of 80 hertz side information in uh, Childish Gambino, Suicide Boys, Carrollton. Thirty hertz side information. They are not cutting the sides. They're not monoing the low end. Mr. Carmack can do this all day. Okay. Side information. Now our Grammy winner. Side information down to 30 hertz. Okay. These producers and the engineers who work on these songs, because these have been uh, in some cases mixed and certainly mastered uh, by professionals in the industry, the top professionals in the industry, um, they're not monitoring the low end. Okay. So let's just put that to rest. And uh, you can find some examples if you look of people who are cutting the, the side lows, but they're people who are maybe doing so because they've seen it on YouTube. Somebody said you should do it somewhere, but the professionals in the industry and the, in, in the industry's top artists are not monitoring the low end. So do not be freaked out about putting a small amount, a controlled amount of width in the bottom end of your, of your song. Okay. Let's take, take a look at, uh, I was going to turn the limiter back on and that, uh, I just want you to take a look at the master on my song. So I have side information. I have width in my low end going down all the way to 30 hertz, but it's not in excess of what you see from any one of those songs, right? So it's, it's on par. So back to our 808. Where are we? Um, yeah, that using the convolver in trash with some of those tones is uh, a huge pro move. It's subtle, but you can hear it when you take it away. Okay. You can really hear it when you take it away. Um, you lose the, you kind of cut the kahunas off the track um, to be blunt, and uh, it loses this oomph that it has in the low end if you're just pure mono. Pure mono stuff with no little bit of side information, to me, sounds kind of sterile. And um, the key is to have it be mono compatible. Okay? If you have level loss when you sum the bottom end of your song to mono, like a PA would do for a club system or festival system, then you have a problem. But if, if it's fully mono compatible, if it sounds great in mono, and you're not having level loss from the side information in there, then you just won the lottery, my friend. You have your cake and eat it too. Sweet. So what's this limiter doing? Let's come in here. The, uh, this is my favorite lightweight track limiter. And this is DMG track limit. Um, it uses the same limiting algorithm as Limitless, their flagship limiter, but it doesn't have the big brain on it and the multiband stuff that takes up all the CPU. This is a plugin that you can use all throughout your project. But here I'm just using it on the sub. It's not typical for me to use limiters on individual elements to cut the uh, peak level because I find that in general, what limiters do is they actually make the transients sound dull and they make the track sound kind of flabby. Um, I don't like the sound of limiters. A lot of people out there are using limiters and advocating using limiters. I don't do that. You'll see me use clippers. Okay. And you'll see that later in my process. And I'll explain a bit about why I use clippers because um, they're a better tool in many cases for this type of music. And the engineering that I do, 
than a limiter. But in this case, I want something nice and smooth and warm. I don't want it to distort at all. And so the limiter using the warm style is the way to go. And I'm just, I'm just kind of tickling it. I'm just taking a little bit of level off, fattening up the sub, okay? Yeah, using a nice long-ish release time warm, which is not using a short look ahead time. So it's not running the limiter in a way that it's going to be generating distortion, uh, which is great. Okay, and then after that, I'm just nudging the gain down. So there we go. And uh, now, if we go further into the project, you will hear that 808 is going to change. So I'm doing some sound design stuff uh, in there, and this is really a, a mixing video. So I'm not really going to go into what I'm doing with the sound design, but I will say I covered most of the sound design in that other video, The Art of Modern Sub. I showed exactly how I generated the waveform that I'm using and uh, some of the processing that I did to be able to get uh, those types of sounds. So I'm just going to stay focused here because this video is uh, going to be long enough already. I'm just going to stay focused on the mixing related effects. Now, if we go here, Yeah, you get those nice kind of weird reverses that are happening. Like, what are those? Um, it's not standard 808 territory. So again, this is coming from some neat sound toy stuff. And I just want to go into that real quick. I want to show you what is going on here. Turn off this primal tap rack. And if we take a look, there's uh, automation that's happening. And that is this distortion wobble. So we're just going to focus on this area where uh, we hear this wobble happen, okay? Like here. Yeah, and here. Yeah. Let's focus in on that one. What is going on there? Because you can see that that is automating the mix on the rack. So what's happening inside that rack to give that sound? So this is another sound toy stack inside of the effect rack. And what's being automated is the mix of that rack. And you can see inside, I've got a few effects. So here's without it. That's just a standard kind of sub drop, right? We add in the decapitator. The decapitator is a really easy to use kind of immediate um, saturation color distortion factory, right? You've got drive, so it does uh, saturation. You've got all this control over mix output, as you'd expect. I'm using a little bit of high cut to darken up because we have harmonics in here. And then I'm putting the punish setting on. And uh, you have these different algorithms that you can choose from, different saturation types. But uh, yeah, here it is with the decapitator. Really, so super nice buzzy harmonics just fattens the whole thing up. I don't want that on all the 808, but this nice sub drop. So as you drop in frequency, it's nice to add harmonics in because they're going to help that drop be more audible and when the frequency lowers and lowers and lowers your speakers are less able to produce that so it really helps the perception psychoacoustically of the sub drop and then the next thing i wanted to add in here was a wobble a whoa 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 kind of that's where the tremolator comes in the tremolator is dope it is this kind of tremolo lfo effect that works on amplitude but it has a ton of controls. If you want to get under the hood, you've got this tweak area. You can choose from different waveforms and all kinds of different stuff down here. I kept it pretty simple and I just did an eighth note, dotted eighth note. And then I dragged the feel over to this side, drag, which makes it a bit more lazy. It kind of gets it behind the beat. And so it just gave it a whoa, 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 whoa kind of feel to it, right? Nice. And the last effect is micro shift. Micro shift is a chorus effect that's going to slightly pitch shift the voices it's going to thicken it it's going to widen it and again uh, wouldn't use that on the main 808 but here is a special effect when you're automating it in sounds good you can hear especially if you're listening in headphones you're going to hear the width that ad that adds yeah okay love that that is the effect rack now what's happening is we have this Second one here, which is also 
a sound toys effect rack and I'm running it in parallel as well. And this is where the sound of the reverses is coming in is it's kind of the weird reverse reverb effect. So here, uh, if we go to an area of the song where these are coming in, Okay, so what's going on? Turn this one on. This is Primal Tap. So Primal Tap is a, uh, a delay device, and you can set up specific delays. I didn't get too crazy with this one. I grabbed presets, and I experimented with presets until I found one that I liked. So here's what it sounds like with just the Primal Tap on, the first one. So that already sounds super interesting. And then I accentuated that with another decapitator. Yeah, so I boosted some drive. I'm using the E style here. And then I used uh, quite a bit of high cut. So I, I want the saturation to be darker. So I'm taking some of the higher order harmonics that are being created. I'm attenuating those like that. And then I used another primal tap. Again, this is uh, just a different preset. I haven't modified it from the preset at all. I just added it in. And here's what it sounds like with that stacked in. Nice. Okay, now after that rack and the automation that's happening, I have uh, two things. The PsyQ. So I just have another PsyQ in here and it's just doing a little touch up. I have this running uh, the mid bell at uh, 8K, pushing that up. And then I have the highs uh, being attenuated just a touch. Yeah, that mid bell push up is really helping out the perception of that uh, reverse effect. And then the devil lock, this is a, a neat one. And uh, this, they call it an audio level destroyer. Very simple effect. Um, I like these because you can just twist a couple knobs and get results really quickly. They're very immediate. And so I'm using the crush here, the crush knob, and then I'm turning up the darkness parameter, which again, takes the edge off the top end. You can hear that added crunch. Here's bypassed. It just gives this ripping, shredding kind of sound to it that I love. Yeah, right on. Okay, so we've got all of that stuff together, and that is the full uh, effects chain that's on this track. Now, um, there's a couple of returns that are happening here. And if we show this one, this is a ambience that's uh, going on. It's, uh, this is happening in FabFilter uh, Pro R2. And then we have this one, which is early reflections. And that's happening in the Paragon plugin from New Gen Audio. And that's just adding uh, some neat space. Again, space, right? There's some width in the, around the 808. And there's a good reason why I'm using both of these. Um, I just found the 808 was sounding a bit too mono and sterile. And I wanted to give it a bit of oomph around it. So I used uh, both of those devices um, to give some space around it. Um, it's, it's, I can't AB these actually because of the routing. I'm capturing all of my returns to a, a different uh, bus. So it's actually difficult for me to show you just these returns in this. But uh, if I play it in the mix and I disable these sends, let's just have a listen. Now let's go to a section where we're in the kind of outro here. Okay, now let's turn these on. Okay, I'll max these out just so you can really hear them, right? Okay, you kind of hear what they're doing, but I have them just mixed in, nudging them into the mix. Nice. Okay, now we have... Um, Processing happening above this. So this 808 is now routed from this group here out to submix 8.2, which is the 808 submix. Now, if you haven't seen yet in my videos, 
this template that I use for mixing, because I use a template all the time when I'm producing and mixing, called the Lightspeed Production and Mixing Template. And I have a sophisticated submixing structure that I use always. And uh, it really gives me an edge when it comes to mixing quickly and, and at a really uh, clean, high fidelity, loud level. My last video, I did a huge walkthrough on this template. So I'm going to link it below and up in the cards. Um, the template is a free download. And I have templates available for Ableton Live and Logic, probably adding one for FL Studio soon based around this submixing structure. So make sure you check those out. So we'll just bounce up to the submixes. And here is that uh, 808 submixing structure right now. So this is the 808. And let's go ahead and just drop in right here. Okay, so here are the effects on it. We'll just go through those. We're kind of familiar with the PsyQ now. You can see, what am I doing? I'm just pushing up the low, and this is a, a really nice uh, broad bell at about 20 hertz. So it's just nice to, to give it some, some girth down low. And nothing else is happening in the EQ um, here, except a little bit of drive is being pushed. So this is a nonlinear EQ. Um, it's not a clean, transparent EQ like a Pro-Q3. This is when you want to add color, dirt, grit to something. So that is what this is doing. It really, really oomps up the low end. Is that a word? Oomps. <laughs> it amps up the low end. There we go. Uh, okay. Now we have the new-ish Isotope Neutron 4. Um, this is a psychoacoustic, um, how would I say this? It's a, it's a spectral shaping plugin. Okay. And I've just grabbed one of the styles here called bass, deep bass. Okay. And then I've adjusted the amount and the tone. So let's listen with this bypassed and then. big difference right i love what this is doing um i just customized the settings on a little bit but otherwise this is just stock you throw it on and it, and it sets this up like this and uh yeah it just gives the 808 more uh a, more, a deeper sound and eliminates a little bit of the uh the mid-range out of it and I, I love it i love what it's doing okay next up we have some general shaping with pro q3 so here's without Nice. And so we're just shelving down the high end, shelving down the super, super lows a little bit, to, partially to compensate for the amount of low frequency, really low frequencies that PsyQ is adding. And then I have, uh, I'm just dropping a, a bell a little bit here in the dynamic mode. And uh, that's kind of controlling the 80 hertz octave range. And then I have uh, a boost going right here on a little bit of dynamic uh, compression. And then a little bit of static boost here just to control the bottom octave. This is the fundamental frequency of the 808 when it's hitting the root. It's a F, a root note of the, of the song, okay? Nice. And then our uh, now familiar track limit, again, in the warm style, a little bit of a tighter release here, just, just giving it a little bit of extra uh, control, reducing peak level. And then this is just the final level control using the utility to control how loud it is into the entire song. Okay, so, uh, so there it is, everything all in for the 808. Nice. Okay, there was a lot there. Stay with me because it'll be faster going through some of the other tracks here. There's, there's not as extensive stuff going on, but the 808 is really like, it's the most important part of this song. So you've got to get that right. And uh, I was really nudging things around and playing with plugins to, to get it in the pocket in this case. And I'm really happy with how it turned out. Let me know what you think about it. Now, in the intro of the song, um, I wanted to have a high-passed 808 that was a hint at what's to come. 
and uh, I want, but I want it to be more buzzy, more saturated. And so here's the the very beginning of the song. So you can hear how that translates through, transitions through nicely to the main 808 as it comes in, and it gives us kind of like an eight bar phase to mix with. And so what's going on with this 808, saturated 808? It's a, basically a copy of the 808 below. And then uh, I'll close that up and just go into what's different. So it's the chain of effects uh, following the main rack. You can see high pass filter, pretty self-explanatory. That's uh, cutting out the super low end so that it, we have something to add in, some oomph to add in uh, that's going to help the energy of the, of the track when the drop comes in. And then we have um, this audio effect rack with some automation on it. The automation isn't doing anything in this section of the track. So let's take a look. Yeah, here it is. Okay. Let's go here. So what that is doing is uh, bringing in a, another sound toys effect called Filter Freak. And there is a low pass filter on that that's kind of just gradually filtering down in the outro of the song just to remove some energy as you mix out of the song. So it's a little different than a standard low pass filter. You can see we have mix control, you know, frequency resonance, all of that stuff. But we also have an envelope follower. Okay, so we can... Uh, change the envelope follower as usual there's a tweak which kind of opens up a more advanced panel but you don't have to look at that all the time which is nice to have that folded away and we have an envelope follower that's moving the filter cutoff right so it's giving it some move here's that word again that i it's not even a word it's 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 giving it some movement is what i meant to say so it's moving the uh the filter and just giving it some some nice energy okay here's without that altogether. So it's kind of buzzy, right? Yeah, like that. Okay, I told you I was going to get into clippers. Now here is my favorite track clipper. I'm going to remove the limiter after this. And um, yeah, this is Orange Clip by uh, Schwab Digital, Ryan Schwab. And uh, I think he has just made incredible clippers. This is modeled after the uh, clipper from FL Studio. And uh, he can't say that, but I can. <laughs> That's what it's modeled on. That's why it's called Orange Clip. And uh, yeah, it's a faithful rendition of that very famous clipper that has become synonymous uh, with kind of modern bass music. It's, it's used everywhere. And uh, what am I doing with it? I'm soft clipping. So this, this is the knee parameter, right? So you can control the amount of knee like so. And then uh, you can see how much clipping is happening right here. And when I change the amount of uh, gain into the clipper, you can see the output gain goes down at the same time, which is actually awesome. And you can link them like this. So the workflow in this clipper is so fast, so fast. And um, you have A-B states, um, you have control over oversampling and, uh, and, and all of that stuff. So yeah, it's it's really amazing. So uh, here is without and with the soft clipping. So we're able to get a reduction in peak level, right? That's what that's what I'm looking for here, and uh, it's it's helping to. Um, give us a bit extra harmonics and it's knocking peak level off the uh, off the sound here and I'm good with that. Then next up we have our DMG track limit again just giving it a little extra squeeze again now using the slightly faster uh, punchy style. Yeah, it's just just giving it a tiny little tickle um, there. So I tend to um, I tend to run gain reduction effects all kind of like little little bits of reduction no one 
stage is doing a ton of gain reduction in most cases uh, because you get less artifacts like that. So it's just these little touches, little nudges, little little attenuations here and there. All right. So there's the, the saturated 808. And, uh, and again, I have uh, some returns happening on it. Okay. So I have uh, early reflections again from the, the uh, Paragon uh, reverb. And I have the group here or the return track here called Thicken and Widen, which is one of those um, micro shifts, which I'll show you from Sound Toys. And then this one is the ambience. So uh, yeah, because we're talking about these, let, let me just show you quickly the returns that I'm using. Okay. So here is the new gen Paragon. Now I have like an hour and 15 minute long deep dive video with the product specialist from new gen. His name's Freddie. And uh, we just went to town on this plugin. It's a recent video on the YouTube channel. I will link it below in the description. Okay. So new gen Paragon. So I'm not going to go into it. It's a, it's a big deep dive for sure. But what I'm doing is I have this reverb set to only be the early reflections. There is no tail. Okay. There's no diffuse tail that's happening here. It's just the early reflections. So I'm using it just to give a sense of nice acoustic space around things. And it does a great job of that. And then when I need to add something to push or, or set the depth staging in the song, I'm using different reverbs for that. Okay. So I have two types of early reflections. One's short, one's long. They're both in Paragon. So sim simulating a very small space and a, a medium sized space. That's what these are. And then the push plate, this is what I'm using when I want something to sound further away or to sound really lush. Okay. This is the Sound Toys Super Plate. And uh, I've been using Little Plate for a long time, which is a super lightweight, very inexpensive plugin that uh, models the EMT4140 uh, plate reverb. But uh, this one, they added a whole bunch of other algorithms. There is a tweak area, which is becoming familiar now, a ton of um, additional parameters here. You have um, pre delay, which wasn't in Little Plate. You have filtering. Uh, so you have a high passing and low passing filter. And uh, yeah, this is just an amazing lush reverb. We're going to get into um, how this sounds later in the project when I show you things that are running through it. Here is the thicken and widen return track. And this is what I'm using to do that. So this is 100% wet. This is the Sound Toys micro shift. And uh, I'm using the first style and um, I'm kind of leaving it stock. You can, you can control the amount of detune the amount of delay on the unison voices if you want to. And then I have Echo Boy, another Sound Toys uh, delay here, which is amazing. A one eighth note dotted uh, delay with a lot of saturation on it. You'll hear that come in in the project. I'm using high pass and low pass filters on it to kind of band pass the return. And then the final one that we, you've heard me talk about a couple times is uh, Fab Filters Pro R2. And I'm using their deep ambience preset. So in here, I oftentimes go for the ambience folder because they're very, very small when I want to just give a bit of uh, sheen around something. So it do it's not like a dry digital in the box kind of pure sound. Just want to add some acoustic space around it. Yeah, I'm using that pretty much uh, stock preset. I've just added in a high pass uh, filter on it so that we're cutting any muddy lows out of the signal. And you can see it's like uh, it's 0.2 seconds, right? 200 milliseconds It's very short very short. So that's the return structure uh, that I am using in the project. And uh, now to kind of round out what's happening in this uh, 808 group, let's go up now to this 808 accent base. And uh, you heard it come in in the intro. So here it is on its own. Sounds kind of weird and, and uh, thin on its own, right? But this is why you don't work in solo. Uh, summed with the 808 sounds different. Yeah, okay, now here it is in uh, a drop. So these are just uh, much more mid-range and high frequencies that I've added to complement the 808 as, uh, as an accent. So what's going on with this chain? Let's just uh, take all of the uh, devices down here and go through them. So uh, yeah, first up is uh, 
Well, first up and second up is Sound Toys Decapitator. Okay, so here's without. Let's just solo this and find a section. Yeah, so here's with. I'm using the T style. You have tone control. I'm cutting lows and uh, I'm giving it quite a bit of drive. And then I have it almost full wet uh, in the mix there. And then that wasn't given me enough. So I added a second decapitator. Um, it, you know, in here, if, if the first one isn't giving you enough and you want to go harder, you just hit this punish knob. Okay, let's check that out. But that was just a bit over the top for me. I didn't want uh, to go quite that level of audio destruction on it. So I added in a second decapitator with uh, similar settings. But on this one, I did use the punish. Okay, so let's listen without and with. It just sounded different, right? Rather than pushing the first one too hard, this one actually sounds quite different, even though it's using the punish. Okay, and then I added in some Sound Toys Filter Freak, which we've now had an introduction to. And uh, you'll see very commonly me using the uh, envelope follower on the mod, which is going to move the filter frequency. You can hear the resonance on that filter, just adding some bite to the top of the bass, right? That's without it. With. Yeah, I really like how that got the top end of that to uh, to bite. Okay, now we're doing some EQing, EQ shaping in uh, transparently in Pro Q3. Pretty simple stuff here. Here's without. And again, that's going to sound really thin, but I'm, I'm doing that intentionally so it doesn't conflict with the 808. This is you know, this low shelf is happening just in the mid channel. And then we have this boost that's happening in the side channel. And so it's, it's moving the 808 and, and this bass in, in a way that they play more nicely together. And okay? you can tell when you sum them. Yeah. Okay. So now we have PsyQ. Yeah, nice, nice color here. And I'm going pretty hard actually on PsyQ. So I'm not using the low band, I'm using the mid band. You can see here, uh, I have it set to about 5 dB of boost at uh, 2.3K. And then I have the top band really uh, pushing up a ton. This is giving a ton of bite to the top end of the sound just to get it to, to voice. Then I have it running into just a standard Ableton uh, saturator device on medium curve. Now we have another Pro Q3 continuing to shape the sound. Okay, so just giving it a, a nice big frequency boost where I want it to cut through the mix. I'm getting rid of the uh, low end here because I, again, I don't need it in here when you sum it with the 808 and then just rolling out a little bit of very top end with the shelf. Now, I still was having conflict with this and the sub, the 808. They, they just weren't sitting quite well in the whole mix, if you listen. So, this is a uh, Magic plugin. This is also by NewGen. And this is called Stereoizer. And it is a way of, in a quite a mono-compatible fashion, playing with an interaural time difference and an interaural level difference. Um, I'm not going to go deep into this plugin. I'm just going to say that it spreads things left and right in a way that a Haas effect, a standard Haas effect, or other stereo wideners, like uh, something just is just going to do mid-side balance, can't and don't do, right? So this helps to sit the accent base in the wide part of the stereo field and allows the 808 lots of room to breathe. Okay, so I will disable it and add it in. And let's listen, summing with 
the 808, okay? So here's with it disabled and you'll watch me click it in. Night and day, right? Like huge, huge difference. Uh, great. Yeah, I, I use that plugin quite a bit when I when I need to control the width of an element. I'm not using mid side, you know, stereo width plugins uh, to be able to do that. I find they just make things sound hollow if you do it, and also they can cause mono compatibility issues. Next up, orange clip. I told you I use clippers on pretty much everything that isn't uh, sub, and sometimes I use clippers followed by a limiter. So I'm doing uh, a a ton. This sound, uh, I just was really wanting it to bite in a particular way. And it was also hitting the mastering limiter because I have it quite loud in the mix. And I didn't want it to be making the mastering limiter freak out. And so I ran it into a ton of, uh, in this case, hard clipping. I'm not using soft clipping here at all. You can see the knee is at zero, so that's hard clipping it. And uh, let's listen without and with. Now, obviously, that's creating a ton of level increase because I'm not gain staging the output down. It's normal for me to adjust the output gain down at the same time as pushing gain into the plugin. But in this case, I actually wanted it to come up in level a lot. So that's why I did it. And even though I'm running hard clipping on it, it's hard clipping 13.7 dB. It's the sound I want. Do not be afraid to push clippers if it still sounds good, if it still sounds how you want it, clean, you know? And a lot of you will have noticed I'm not using oversampling in this. Normally, if I'm pushing a clipper this hard and it's producing that many high-frequency harmonics, this is one of the cases where I would engage oversampling, but I can't have oversampling on, on all my clippers uh, in this project while screen recording because it just makes the whole thing grind to a, uh, a halt. So um, normally, oversampling would be on there. And I will say the, the oversampling algorithm in Orange Clip is now the same anti-derivative, anti-aliasing oversampling process. It's a mouthful, sorry about that. That is from Gold Clip, okay? I, I'm going to have separate videos on that and why that is the way it is. Um, there's a video I did called The Science of Clipping, and you need to watch that, okay? Clipping is so critical to a loud, clean mixing workflow in these types of genres. If you're not using clipping, uh, you're not going to, your, your projects are really not going to stand up against projects that are using clipping. So um, I will drop a link and a card to the Science of Clipping video. Definitely make a note to watch that one so you can see a bit more about uh, what I'm talking about here. Yeah, and then DMG track limit afterwards, just again to, to control level. This sound was able to take a lot of clipping and a lot of limiting, so... And then I had uh, a rack here. Let's see where it's being automated on. Yeah, here we go. You can see here. Okay. So uh, this rack is uh, just coming in in these accent areas. And it's running, uh, just making it sound really, really big here. So we're using uh, two plugins. From Sound Toys, the Crystallizer. And uh, I use the Great Doubler preset. And the Crystallizer is a kind of granular sounding effect. Uh, again, you have got a tweak area down here. But uh, I'm just, yeah, they call it a granular echo synthesizer. And uh, in this case, I really liked the sound of this Great Doubler. I wanted it to sound bigger and wider. <laughs> Yeah, nice. Okay. And then um, and then I added the super plate in. And uh, I actually used the super plate quite a bit as an insert rather than a return in this project um, to, to control the depth and the sense of space around things. I used this um, algorithm instead of the classic EMT-140 and uh, liked the sound of that in this case. You can see I'm using uh, the high pass filter, quite a bit of pre-delay and uh, one second decay time. Yeah, right on. So that's just making it sound really big in that section. And then I have a utility 
gain staging down at the end of the chain. Okay. So uh, yeah, let's just listen in the whole mix to see how this is sounding. So moving on up, let's get into this group that has a couple of bases in it. So these are bases from Subboom Base and Omnisphere. And uh, this one's a layer. So this comes in in drop 2.1. And it sums with that accent base. And the 808. Okay, so what's going on here? A simpler chain of effects. I told you guys things would get easier as we got out of the 808 range. That's where all the processing was happening. A lot of the processing. Okay, so we have a sound toys effect rack. And uh, we have now, we're getting familiar with these effects now, right? I've talked about these a few times. So we've got micro shift. Here's without. And with. I'll turn the mix up just so you can really hear this. Ooh, I actually like that. I think I was too conservative with <laughs> with that. And what it's doing here is it's uh, spreading it out. You know, it's it's giving it some width in the stereo field uh, again because the 808 is dominant in the center. Okay, so now uh, next in chain we have the Echo Boy uh, Junior, and this is a uh, a delay, right? And the way I have this set up is I'm using the minimum amount of feedback, right? So it's just uh, actually really, it has the mode set to wide. And um, it's, again, it's adding space around the sound. Yeah, like that. And then... We have our super plate. Let's see what's going on here. If I turn up the wet dry, so you can really hear this. Yeah. So we are just giving it a bunch of oomph there and. And again, playing with it in the stereo field uh, to have it sit. So it's taking up the bottom in the, in the side channel a bit more than the mid. Okay. And then we have, uh, there's a lot of low end information in there, right? There was a ton of low end. So I'm taming that up with the Pro Q3, rolling out some highs. And you can see here in the, in the mid channel only, I am creating space for the 808 to sit below that. And then here we have a side channel um, and a mid channel and again, just knocking some low mids out of that. So that's what the EQ is doing. And then orange clip, what's going on with orange clip? Soft clipping, that's in the standard kind of default that it loads with the negative 4.4 knee. And we're just pushing some clipping on this sound. knocking off peak level. Oh, you can see this is the way I normally have it set up. I have it set up with the link control on. So as I turn up the input, it turns down the output at the same time, right? And uh, I just like that workflow when I work with the clipper. Okay. And then uh, just a little bit of trim control on the end of it to, to nudge it to where I want in the mix. You'll see me almost never using my mixing faders. Like if you look at, look at the mixer. Okay. Almost everything's at zero because I'm not in the fine, fine mixing stage with this project yet. This is still kind of like a, a detailed rough mix, right? 
And then when I go to my final mixing stage, when I'm just giving things a little flick here and there, I go to my mixing faders. But everything else, when I'm rough mixing the project, I'm using the utilities here to rough things in. And uh, yeah, lots of good reasons for that. Nice. And then we have a breakdown base. So this is in the, as we come in here, play the whole project. This is the second breakdown. Okay, this is the bass from uh, rendered out from Subboom Bass. Great bass plugin too. Very simplistic what's going on here. It's kind of exposed on its own. I didn't need to do a lot of processing on this. So I just used a, uh, a saturator and then a couple of uh, utilities. This one's doing automation where you can see here as it descends down in pitch, this is leading up to the drop. I pushed a lot of gain because you can see it's kind of diminuendoing. So uh, let's just listen to what the saturator's doing. Just adding a bunch of uh, density to the sound. And then uh, this sound drops. So listen here and I'll show you the automation. Uh, correction, it doesn't drop, it turns into a riser, <laughs> but uh, it was diminuendoing, it was losing levels, so I, uh, that's why I added that uh, gain up there. Sweet, okay, so there we are in the bases, and uh, these bases are running up into the second submix um, for the bass, so the 808s, uh, and then the bass submix, and then they both sum into bass plus 808. So let's take a look up in the submixes what's happening on this bass group and there's just a little limiter on it okay so this is just track limit see it's not even getting touched um but if we go in the this drop So it's just getting tickled just a little bit when you have the largest amount of bases all in right here in this section of the project we have the 808 we have the accent base and we have that omnisphere base all together and this is just me controlling that uh, full summed amplitude on that uh, on that submix okay so that is all that's happening there and now we have 808 done we have bass done and it is time to get into the drums so similar to how I've approached everything else, we'll start from the bottom up with the kick drum. Okay, so let's go here, solo up the kick. Yeah, so it's a pretty crunchy, kind of distorted, hard sounding kick. Again, it's meant to sum with the 808, the main 808. So I, I quite like how they work together. They can sound weird and disjointed on their own, but uh, they do work together in the project. Now, uh, maybe what they'll do in this case is I'll disable all of the effects that are um, downstream of this on the on the kick submix. Um, sorry about not doing that before on the uh, 808, but uh, yeah, let's listen to it uh, now here with the effects chain. And let's just solo up the kick. Nice. So let's take off the effects. And here's just the bare sample, okay? You can hear it's actually got a bit of ambience in the tail, uh, but it's kind of a, it's like that thud kick sound, and that's what I was going for here. First thing I did, I was like, I want this to sound distorted. So I used the decapitator on it. I use the decapitator all through this project on tons of stuff. Here's without and with. You can hear what the punish does. I, I like it. I like that that's available to me if I just want to like next level sizzle something. 
Uh, but in this case, it's a kick. I, I don't want to go too crazy on it. So I, I used a bit of mix. I took the edge off the very top end with the high cut. Love that. And uh, I gave it some thump. And the thump is really neat. It actually um, adds uh, a little bit of bottom end. It's not like a resonance, but it gives it a bit of bottom end amplitude push at the uh, cutoff frequency of the of the low cut, right? So it just gives it some really nice kind of very, very bottom end to that if you turn on the thump, which in this case I wanted out of the kick. And then I'm just using drive. Just so you can hear what the different styles sound like, I'll just quickly parse through these. They are quite different. Uh, you might hear that as subtle, but but when I switch between them, I can hear a distinct difference. So it is nice to have that ability to just quickly tailor in the type of harmonics that you want on your sound. So there's the decapitator. Okay, this clip, this <laughs> this clip, this kick, I clipped the living daylights out of. I don't know how I got away with this much clipping on it because I'm using clipping in a variety of stages downstream of this, but um, for some reason it worked, um, and. This is a, another clipper that I will use sometimes. This is from Newfangled Audio, and this one's called Saturate. And the difference between this clipper and Orange Clip is this is a spectral clipper. And if you take this detail preservation parameter and you turn it all the way up, then it functions differently from a single band clipper. Okay, This is a rabbit hole I am not going to go down right now. I'm just going to show you um, the basic clipping layout. I'm, uh, again, not using anti-aliasing. I am using the hard clipper, and I'm just, uh, or rather not, I'm using mostly soft clipping here. The clipper shape is down towards soft 30% versus hard, because again, I want to generate audible harmonics here. I'm using this for tone shaping, for character, rather than just for peak level reduction. Okay, so uh, yeah, here it is with, uh, with this on. So it's just kind of touching the top of the kick, okay? So then we have Isotope Neutron Transient Shaper. And this is a plugin you are gonna see a lot uh, on the drums. I'm using it sometimes uh, three or four places in the chain on a drum. And I'm using it maybe in a different way from how you might've seen Transient Shapers work. And uh, when you're pushing a drum into any type of gain reduction, especially clipping, because there's no attack and release on a clipper, what you're doing is you're getting loudness, which is great. A lot of times you're generating harmonics in a way that adds to the perceived loudness of the drum. But if you push it too hard, two negative things can happen. One is you can lose the effect of the punch on the front of the drum because you are taking the transient away. You're taking the amplitude part of the push of the front of the transient away. Normally, that's compensated for by the harmonics that the clipper adds, giving the perception of punch to the drum, which is coming from the harmonic density and not from the amplitude. This is why you do not need as much dynamic range in music when you are using clippers on the individual sounds. Okay. However, the other downstream thing that happens that can be bad is you're increasing the amount of body amplitude of the drum. And so your drums, that makes them sound too, oftentimes, too blown out and over-compressed. So a lot of people that don't do this, don't use transient shapers in this way, they're just pushing all their drums up into a clipper and they sound rubbish. It's garbage loudness because all the drums, all the bodies are too loud. All the decays of the drums are too loud and the whole thing just sounds like a mess. It doesn't sound tight and punchy. And that's what I'm going for in this. I want loud drums, punchy drums, and I don't want the big, long, flabby tails. I don't want that level increase in the whole body of the drum. And so this is where I'm using the transient shaper. So I'm pushing a little bit of attack, but look at what I'm doing to the release. Negative four on the release. I'm using, uh, in this case, the balanced uh, and then sharp. And uh, yeah, here's without and with.
it just tightens up that, that body and tail of the drum, right? And that's just a light touch. You're going to see me do this a lot more um, in other drums. Okay, now we have a, a more aggressive clipping stage. We're using orange clip here, and uh, I'm using it in hard clipping. Here's without. Now I'm, I'm taking level off this, but the perception of the punch of the drum is coming from the harmonics that are now being added in from that clipped transient, right? So the drum sounds to me just as punchy, if not punchier and louder, even though we've knocked peak level off. Look at our peak level. See, we've earned ourselves um, a few dB of uh, extra headroom by using the clipper, which is one of the main reasons I use them. Okay, now we're just shaping a little bit of level on the utility. Okay, now that kick is going up into the uh, bus, uh, the submix. However, um, I will note that I'm using some early reflections here, negative 25 into the early reflections A in Paragon, and then I'm using negative uh, 24 dB into the Fab Filter Pro R2 to give some ambience around the kick. I am not afraid of having a little bit of stereo space, a little bit of side channel information around the kick. Again, for the aforementioned reasons and the songs that I showed you. Okay, so now let, let's go up and see what's going on because there's definitely more shaping that's going on. I kind of wanted to, when I got up into the submixes, I just wanted to focus on more final refining shaping rather than the hard, heavy lifting. And so that's one of the big benefits of having the submixing structure is it allows me to kind of forget without printing. I don't have to render this stuff, but it allows me to kind of forget and get out of my field of vision the previous processing that's happening and just focus on what what needs to happen from this point on okay so now let's go here up to the kick and we'll turn on these effects one by one so here's where we're at okay another transient shaper now i told you i was going to use a lot of these what's happening in this one i'm using precise mode i'm using sharp that's usually how i use this one okay more attack 6 db of attack negative 11 db of sustain okay so i'm really giving the the drum a bunch of punch on the front end and i'm taking away the body here's without and with yeah and, and just before you maybe think that i'm out to lunch on this um the engineer i learned this technique from is luca pretalesi you hear me talk about him a lot and if you listen to the drums on that skrillex rumble song or almost any of the other songs that are in my reference group. They're really short, they're really tight, and they're really punchy, even though all of those tracks are using clipping on the drums, for sure. You don't have that sense of big, flabby, over-compressed, blown-out drums that you would get if you just took a regular drum and you pushed it up into a clipper like, like beginners do, okay? Luca, and now myself, having learned from him, have gotten used to doing dramatic sustain attenuation using this particular transient shaper and uh, i just love the sound you're going to hear it more uh but pay attention okay so now we're pushing this into isotope trash 2 and in a similar way to how you heard me using trash 2 on the 808 i'm using it in a very similar way on the kick i'm adding some stereo information um actually i'm not in this case i'm using a convolve um area that, that just adds body around it but it doesn't actually add stereo information and I'm using saturation. So let's take a look here and uh, I'll turn off the convolve, turn off the trash, and then I'll add those in. Okay, so what's, what's going on there? Top band, nothing's happening. Mid band, okay, I'm using tape saturation, 30% uh, wet, two decibels of drive. Okay, here's the mid band. So it's accentuating the knock of the kick, but really the big stuff's happening on the bottom band. I'm using this one. I'm pushing up the, the shape, okay? So it just gives the bottom of the kick uh, a, just a kind of a blown out feel to it. 50% in the mix, um, 2 dB of pre-drive into that. Okay, so that's what's going on with the trash. 
Now, if we look at the convolve area, you can see, again, I'm in the tone area. And there, and I'm using this impulse response called creep. And again, very low in the mix, you can see. Here's uh, without it. Here's with it. Like, night and day, right? That, that is a huge difference to the sound of the kick. I'm going to really turn it up. Again, it's going to sound rubbish, but I just want you to hear what this IR sounds like. What? Yeah, okay. It's like Bigfoot decided to get on your drum kit and hit the kick drum. Um, but when you, when you mix it really low, 10%. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, it's a, that's a huge, huge aspect of the chain um, there. Okay. Um, I encourage you to use trash um, and the, the convolve area. Uh, it's just amazing what it does for dimension with, uh, with drums and basses and stuff like that. These, again, very short ambiances. Okay, we've got some EQ happening. That creep is adding a lot to the very rumbly low end of the kick. So I'm backing that off here with a low shelf. And there's a bit of this knock kind of that's happening, 350. You know, sometimes with kicks, uh, they can sound a bit muddy. And so I'm just pulling some 350 out of this one. And then at the fundamental of the kick, or rather the fundamental of, uh, it's not necessarily the fundamental of the kick, but this is corresponding to the root note of the song. I'm in the mid channel only. I'm doing a dynamic uh, boost just to, just to give the kick a bit of uh, low frequency push. Uh, at the same frequency that the 808 is hitting. Nice. More clipping. More clipping. Okay. Um, how much clipping can a sound take? Well, it depends how distorted you're comfortable with it being. In this case, the type of kick that suits this track, to me, I was able to get away with, with really pushing clipping in a way where I'm not doing it transparently. I'm really pushing a lot of harmonics with it. I'm making the kick sound super dirty. I like it subjectively, stylistically, you might not. So take it or leave it. But uh, I just kept going with the clipping. Okay, so here it is without. With. Yeah, love that. And I said as well, as you use more and more clipping, the drum's going to sound more and more over compressed and flabby and the body of the drum in amplitude is going to come up relative to the transient. So again, shaping. Okay. I'm just doing these little bits of shaping. This is a negative three on the sustain now. And I use the loose algorithm here. Um, normally I use precise or balanced, usually precise, but uh, in this case, um, I just a beat it and I got the sound that I wanted. So here, here the difference that's, that's making, right? So it's like going kind of with the, the creep convolve. And I wanted to rein some of that in to tighten up the tail of the drum. Okay. Yeah. Right on. There's the kick. And, uh, but what's going on uh, below here? This is just a simple um, reverse, okay? So this is just a, a reverse kick that comes in. Yeah, so this goes here. Let's listen to it in the song. Very simple effect. And then uh, I have these breakdown drums. Let's check these out. So uh, I'm not going to go too far into this kit, but I will go into what's going on processing it after. And uh, obviously you can hear there's uh, a delay that's happening on that that uh, gives it an interesting sound. So I'll just go into what is happening inside of this rack. So we have the uh, Soundtoys Filter Freak, the Micro Shift, and Echo Boy. 
and you can see that everything green here is being automated by this knob, this macro, and you can see that is increasing as the drum kit progresses, giving the sense of kind of a, a buildup, which is what I wanted to do with it. So what's it doing inside of Filter Freak? You can see here, there's uh, two filters. So this is a, a high pass filter. And then we have uh, the second one, which is a low pass filter, right? And then they're moving together with that envelope shaper trick that I was doing. And then the automation is making both of the frequencies go up. So it just gives a nice sense of a, a rising sensation with that. Take off the Echo Boy. And then we've got Micro Shift. Okay. Micro Shift is, uh, again, just giving the drums kind of a surreal processed feel that works for me in this breakdown. Nice. I like that. And then uh, really the meat of this effect is coming from Echo Boy Jr. And so you can see there's the mix of the effect is being controlled by that knob, the amount of saturation and the echo time and the feedback. They're all moving in unison to create this um, really granular sounding delay that uh, gives the rising build up feel. Okay, so let's look at the automation and we'll see what's going on in this plugin. Yeah, so the uh, feedback is increasing, the mix is increasing, the delay time is changing. So it's all just giving this really interesting build effect in the plugin. And that's the, exactly the type of creative effect that these plugins are, are great for, okay? So after that, we just have a Ableton saturator making things a bit louder, given some harmonics. And our now familiar orange clip. Okay. So we use the bypass in the plugin. And this is using a knee on it, so it is doing soft clipping. Nice. Just adding some perceived loudness uh, and punch to the drums, some harmonics as a next stage. And then now I'm basically rough mixing it with the utility. So there it is. Those are the breakdown drums. And uh, let's go up now to snares and claps. Okay. There's a lot kind of, of snares and claps you can see in here. A lot of different types. We have these uh, intro drums. Now that is all happening in a similar way. That build that you're hearing is happening with uh, sound choice plugins as well. And uh, I really wanted to create the sense of a crescendo, a build, um, but just do it with the drums. So if we go in here and we take a look at what is uh, being played in the kit. It's this. It's clap A. So... If we take a look at what's going on, I'm going to just close that rack for now. Um, real quick, everything gets clipped pretty much. Things that I don't clip are very few and far between. Yeah, so it's hard clipping there on the, uh, on the clap, like that. And then we have a Pro Q3, making it a little bit brighter, cutting some, some low end there. Just a little bit of drum shaping. Now here is uh, where that build is coming from. So we can see here, this audio effect rack has a macro labeled build slash excite. And that is exactly what's going on. And the parameters that are being controlled uh, by this, if we take a look, it's this 
automation curve that's happening that is controlling that. And uh, what that's doing inside this rack is it's controlling the echo boy and it's controlling the mix, the feedback, and that's it in echo boy. And then it's also controlling in superplate the decay time, the output, the mix, and the high cut. Okay, so all those are working in unison with each other uh, to create this wonderful uh, energy building effect that leads up into where the main drums and 808 come in. Okay, so let's just take a look at the, uh, the effects and uh, see what they're doing. You can watch the parameters move. And then maybe actually I should cut that a little bit before so that when we hit the first beat, it doesn't have all of that uh, decay going on. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So uh, then what is this rack doing? Okay. There's this rack that came in called Haas and Reverb. And uh, if I click on that, you can see it is automating in right here. So let's listen to this section and see what this is doing. Let's listen to that in the full mix. So we have, we have a main snare that's happening here that's in the center. And now that we're in the main part of the song, I wanted these claps that are happening, that are creating this build to be spread out. So that's all I did here is uh, I used the new gen audio stereoizer to give a bit of an interaural time difference and level difference, just spreading the, the claps out. And I didn't need to do that in the intro because the snare wasn't in. And then I added some reverb just a very small reverb, 350 millisecond decay time, 2.5 millisecond um, pre-delay, and uh, I'm controlling the amount of wet dry from that macro. Okay, so let's just listen to the difference in the, in the claps from these two sections. Nice. Okay, so the other two uh, big drums in here are the uh, main clap. Okay, so if we go into this section. Yeah, I'm just going to show you what is going on real quick with that clap. An Ableton saturator, medium curve, some drive, full wet, running into a clipper. Okay, so we've got, uh, let's just go ahead and label, delete those effects or disable them. Now with the saturator. Okay, now with the clipper. So soft clipping, a little bit of knee. We're getting a lot of clipping on that. So guess what happens next, right? Guess what happens next transient shaper to control that drum now that it's been pushed into clipping negative 12 db do not be afraid to be heavy-handed with the reduction of the body of the drum after you've pushed it into clipping it's part of the secret that makes your drum sound clean and punchy still okay here's without it just kind of sounds flabby right it's too much tail too much body with yeah like it okay here's the eq and uh getting rid of the lows getting rid of the super highs high shelf up and then we have a, a bell pushing up at 22.5 okay here's without everything That's kind of like where the, the meat of the sound is for me. So I was accentuating that. And you can see uh, this is a dynamic 
uh, node here that's going plus 4 dB. This, also dynamic, just helps the clap to have some movement, but it's happening mostly on the, the impact, the front of it, right? Yeah, so just some shaping on the drum. And uh, there we go. Now the other main drum here is the main snare, okay? Yeah. So it just is a way of evolving the drum beat when it comes in. So here's where the snare comes in. Okay, what's going on with the snare? It's actually two snares that are summing together in this instrument rack, okay? And then they are coming into a series of effects. Let's just go through these quickly. Okay, first, some EQ shaping. See, this is a very common type of EQing for me to do on drums without. So I'm doing dynamic nodes here. There's a little bit of static, a little bit of dynamic. 2B dB and 2 dB right here on the fundamental of the of the snare, I think. Yeah. Right. Okay. And then I have a mid only, mid channel only uh bell going uh yeah, up here, 3 dB. And then I have a high shelf, a bit of static, 2 dB static, and 2 dB dynamic. Full stereo. Okay. So it's just giving the drum. Again, some oomph, some movement. Now, transient shaper. Sometimes I put transient shapers before the clipper, and then sometimes I put them after, but I'm always using them on my drums. A lot of times I put them before and after the clipper. But in this case, I'm wanting to really, so you can see, I'm, I'm going as hard as you can go on this. This is as maxed out as, as it gets. This is negative 15 dB sustain, positive 15 dB attack, into a saturator with it, which then goes into another saturator, which goes into clipping. Okay, here's without. Here's with. Night and day difference, right? Um, the snare sounds way tighter, way shorter, way punchier when I'm doing that move. Okay, now we go into a saturator. Just giving it some grit. Now, isotope trash. Similar to the kick drum, I'm doing a, a couple things here. Uh, let's see. So we have it in multiband. There isn't anything happening on the bottom band. The mid band is getting some blitz. And then the top band is getting some tape saturation. Okay. So here is turn off the convolve, turn off the trash. So it's, it's really bringing the snare out, making it brighter. And uh, now what's going on in the convolve area, you can see I'm using that creep, tone area creep again, and 20% uh, in the mix here. Okay, so here's without. And with. Yeah. So it's just adding a bit of dimension to the snare. Nice. Okay, now we're pushing into clipping. So let's take a look at what's going on in the clipper. We are uh, hard clipping, full hard clip, okay? Snares in general can take a lot of hard clipping because there's so much high end in them already. Uh, but here's without the clipper. And with. And when the snare comes in here, I really want it to sound on top of everything else. So that's one of the reasons I'm pushing so much clipping. But now, the more you push into clippers, the more the body of the drum comes up, the more the tail of the drum comes up, the more likely you are to sound over compressed, flabby. Okay, so look at what I'm doing here. Another 10 dB reduction post clipper on the sustained phase of the drum. Okay, here's bypassed. And with. Nice. 
And then we just have a little bit of uh, shaping um, controlling the volume. And that pretty much is the main thing that's going on with snares and claps. You can see in terms of returns, I'm pushing some early reflections, very quiet, negative 25. And I'm pushing a bit of the ambience uh, from the FabFilter Pro R2 using that uh, deep ambience preset just to give some acoustic space to, to make the drums all sound like they're coming from one space in one room, right? That's what I'm doing. I'm creating an acoustic space for the drums. Nice. So now let's go up into the um, hi-hats. And then I'll show you the submixes and stuff like that that are, that are coming above that. Hi-hats are uh, much more simple in terms of processing. I don't really fuss with these uh, a ton. They're going to sound super weird um, because of um, what's happening uh, downstream of, of them summing through the different submixes in the, in the mastering phase. So maybe what'll be best here is for me to go up and just uh, solo uh, the different areas and uh, I'll explain what's going on here. So uh, we had kind of turned everything back on with the kick. There we go. Um, there's no toms in the track. Snares and claps. Okay, let's, uh, let's solo this up and take a look at what was happening with the snares and claps on the bus. Okay, so uh, I wanted to add more saturation to the whole, all the snares as a group. So here we've got Decapitator again, our, our good friend, the Decapitator. Just giving them some sizzle. Okay. And then we've got some general EQ shaping in Pro Q3. Nice. And then a little bit more transient shaper. Again, this is layers of control. Um, I was fine tuning some of the individual drums, but I also fine tune at the bus level. So we're using precise, sharp, and again, we're just knocking some sustain off all of the snares and claps that come through this group. And then a utility just to adjust the actual rough volume of that group. Okay, low perk um, is not being used. You can see it's yellow. Um, things like hand drums and, and uh, congas and stuff like that, that might be coming through there or maybe toms if you didn't have a dedicated tom group. Again, no toms in this track either. So now let's go to take a look at the uh, high perk and I'm going to just disable everything on the all drums and then the high percussion. Now, now we get the kind of cleaner sounding, cleaner sounding hi-hats. Okay, so um, what's going on in here? These are basically just straight up hi-hat samples and I'm doing the processing, aside from just a little bit of EQ shaping, I'm doing the processing on uh, the group, the submix up top. So really that's where we need to go here. Let's take a look at what's happening on the submix. Sometimes I use a clipper first in chain. And in this case, yeah, we're doing hard clipping first in chain. Just a little touch. Not much. Okay. We've got an EQ shaping uh, pretty much everything here. So we're just using a high cut or rather a low cut. And then we're rolling out just a bit of the very top end, you know, 20K uh, shelving filter there. And then we've got this little guy that's happening here, uh, 2 dB dynamic push up. So I'm kind of shifting energy. I'm taking energy away from the very top, super bright range and then putting it down into 8K. Nice. And then I have uh, this, which is a, a ducking device that is an enveloping tool, Devious Machines Duck. Um, I love this plugin and I use it for pretty much all my ducking in this, in this project. I'm not using sidechain compression. I'm not going to talk about this yet. I'm going to talk about the ducking and how it works uh, later. But basically all this is doing is it's reading in from the kick and you can see the kick waveform. It's 50% wet dry in the mix. And uh, it's just, just bringing the hi-hats down a little bit every time there's a kick. So there's really good clarity on the top end of the kick. And it just kind of gets the hi-hats to pulse with the kick drum. 
so they're not all full amplitude. Uh, yeah, just carving out a little bit of space space for the the kick without nuking the hi-hats. And that's why I have this 50% in the mix so that I'm not uh, just totally attenuating the hi-hats fully. And then I have our uh, handy tremolator here and I have it on a quarter note and it's just pulsing a nice slow tremolo pulsing effect on the hi-hats to the quarter note. And it just gives them a, a groove that they otherwise didn't have. Let's listen in the mix. Yeah, right on. And then we've got the utility on there, just doing a little bit of gain adjustment. So all of these uh, drums, these different submixes, are summing up to the all drums and perk submix, okay? So they just kind of collapse underneath there, and that's why they're all colored a darker color of gray and they have the little indent there indicating that they're all summing up into the all drums and perk now there's some really interesting processing that's happening on this drum submix so i'm going to show you what's going on and we have uh this guy right here which are the outro effects being automated on and uh so if we take a look at uh at this one we can see that it is being automated on during the outro and uh, let's listen to the drums in that section. Okay, that's with it. This is without it. So the full normal, full power drum signal is coming into that. But when you turn this on, it is uh, giving it a totally different tone and flavor for the outro of the song. So what's going on? We got a few sound toys effects that are running in here. Uh, first up being the decapitator. Here is without it. Here is with it. And we can see there's a macro that is being automated here. So it's moving things around, parameters around. Okay, so up next we have the Filter Freak 2. So again, that's the two filter version. And we have a high passing filter and a low passing filter, band passing the signal together. And then we have the envelope follower that's moving those things. And then the automation is changing the filter frequencies. So let's listen, see what's happening there. So that's really the core of this outro sound. It's this band passed drum beat feel. So as the knob automates up, the frequency increases. And then just to give the drums a real kind of like processed spacey feel, a different texture to how the main drums sound, I'm using the micro shift as well. So here's that. Yeah, just gives the drums a really uh, different texture for the outro. So that's what's going on with the outro effects rack. Now let's take a look at um, all of these. Okay. So uh, this is uh, a rack that contains a few instances of Decimort. And Decimort, if you're not familiar with it, is a quite an advanced um, bit crusher. And I love the sound of it on drums. So I'm using a few different presets. So Digital Breeze, you can see is mapped out to the Digital Breeze. This one called Paula Noise and Gripbox Mark II. That's just mapping out to each one of these decap or not decapitators, decimorts. And um, each one's just running, these are presets. And I don't think I've changed the presets actually. So let's listen to what's happening when this is coming in. So if we take a look at and reveal the automation, and we see where is this happening here and here. Okay, so it's all happening kind of in here in this section of the song. So let's listen 
here, re-enable automation, leave the drums soloed. You'll be able to watch when this automation comes in and uh, listen to what the decimort is doing to the drum signal. Um, quite interesting. Uh, it just allowed me to play with the uh, with the drums a little bit more. I ne didn't end up using this Paula noise one, I guess. Uh, yeah, there we go. So that's what's happening with uh, with Decimort, and uh, yeah, here we go. It happens again down here. Yeah, let's listen to that in the mix. Yeah, right on. So we can close that rack. And then uh, what's happening here? We have the, uh, the drum builds, okay? And this is being automated on and off. At least I think it is. Are we using this? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so filter frequency is increasing. This is in the build. Nice, right on. Um, something weird's happening with the kick there. What is going on with the kick? Maybe I wasn't supposed to turn that on. Yeah, okay. So um, let's continue in the processing that's happening in the drums. So let's take a look at what is happening here. Uh, let's turn that utility on just because that's probably what is uh, happening that's causing the kick to distort. So many effects, lots going on. So uh, we have um, this decapitator that is happening in a rack. Okay, so let's just uh, see what's going on here. And I have uh, mid-side encoded this by using a uh, Voxango free, Voxango MSCD. So I've been able to split, because the decapitator isn't normally mid-side, it's a stereo saturator distortion device, and I've split this into, um, into mid and side and dry, and I have full control over the uh, side mix, the mid mix, and the amount of uh of decapitator here you can see all on the front panel uh what's going on so those are all in static positions they're not being automated right and if we take a look at what is happening with the decapitator we're using that punish setting we're using the t style and let's just listen to the drums in here and let's turn this off and with it on. So what I wanted to do here, what was I seeking to achieve with this? One, is, well, the main thing I was trying to do is to put the saturation more on the mid channel and less on the side. And that's common for me to do with drums. A lot of times, the more delicate part of the drums, the body, the tails, um, any type of ambience that's uh, on them is in the side channel. And so I don't always want to saturate that and can take the 3D feeling out of the drums if you do that. So yeah, there we go. That's what that rack is doing. And then we are running it into the devil lock. And we had the devil lock on it and uh, that is being automated as well so we have the crush and we can see that the crush is all the way up there's a bit of crunch halfway up on the crunch we're using the darkness control and uh let's see we click on that we can see that is where it's coming in so it's coming in where all the main drums are in 
So it's not in the intro. So it's really making the whole drum group sound quite crunched out um, and limited, dirty limiting uh, on there. So that's what the devil lock is doing. And then we go forwards and we have on the entire drum group is a black box analog design HG2MS and it's in mid side mode. And I am pushing some saturation on the mid channel and less saturation on the side channel. Okay. So if we listen to the drums in the drop and we go ahead and just disable this, I'll add it in. So it's taking away some peak level on the drums and then it's just getting them to sound a little bit bigger. But again, focusing the harmonics on the mid channel and not the side channel. And now our familiar orange clip, we're just running a bit of hard clipping on the, uh, on the drum group as a whole. And this one, because it's on the entire drum group, I am running it in parallel. Okay, so you can see the wet dry are linked. And as I push down the dry, the wet comes up and vice versa. So I'm running it in 50% uh, basically in the mix, uh, full parallel here, uh, just to let some of the dry signal come through uh, because I'm clipping the entire drum group here. Okay. And then uh, the final thing we have aside from the gain stage utility is we have this little VCA utility and it is pushing up the gain of the drums in the outro. So when that um, channel came in, in the outro right here, there was just some level loss. And I wanted to simply automate that up. Yeah, nice. Okay, so there is all of the drums in their entirety all together, summing up into that structure. So now let's get into the synths and mid-range elements that we've got going on. The first group I have here is this one called Crescendos, and it's really common for me to use reverse effects in my production. A lot of times, rather than using like some type of riser sample from a sample pack, which I think sounds kind of cliched and not really that nice, I much prefer to render out big, long reverb tails using the sounds in my own project that I've designed and reverse those and use those as crescendos, otherwise known as reverse reverbs. So that's what I've done here. I've actually used Superplate for all of these ones, which you won't see because it's been rendered to audio. And let's just solo up this little synth splash crescendo, crescendo. Now, the kind of pumping or, or rhythmicness that you're getting in that is because it's being routed into a ducking group. So that's the drums pushing it down that you're hearing. Um, otherwise, it's just a normal kind of clean crescendo. No effects on this, really. It's just a, just a volume control. Okay, super simple. And then we have this one's a bass crescendo. Again, very simple. And then we have these reverses from the little vocal sample. Now you hear a pulsing on that one that isn't the drum ducking, and that's coming from that sound toys tremolo, the tremolator effect. And uh, that's what's happening on this group. So if we take a look, at the only effects that are on the group, we have the tremolator and an EQ. So let's just take a look at what the tremolator is doing. And uh, yeah, it's pulsing everything. So it's using a half note like this, which really has a quarter note feel because we're running the project at 160 BPM. 
And it's a sawtooth up shape, you, which you can see if you open the tweak area like this. And uh, I'm using this drag again, rather than just a regular kind of uh, LFO that has a straight feel to it. I love the ability to control the feel, to rush it or drag it. Um, just such a useful parameter. And uh, there we go. And you have a depth control. So it's just giving this pulsing effect to, uh, to everything. Nice. So that's the tremolator. I use it all through this project on all kinds of different sounds. And then uh, we just have a general shaping EQ doing a low cut. Here, everything below 120 is being cut because a lot of these things are in the project when the 808's in, so I don't want any low end. I want that to be pretty aggressively cut. And then I'm knocking some low mid out with a shelving filter. So 600 and below is being shelved out just to carve out, again, some space for the fundamentals uh, of the instruments that are in the synths and other sounds and to have these effects kind of just tailored up a little bit. So that's all that's going on for EQ. And then uh, this is sending out, you can see where this is routing to, is the soft ducking submix. That's going to come uh, right at the end of this video, talking about how I'm ducking things. Okay, so there is the uh, crescendos group. It's probably the simplest area. Now we have synths. Okay, so yeah, bottom up. Let's just take a look at this one called Synth Wash. And uh, it's a neat little sample. Nice. I actually used uh, generative AI to make that, and uh, that was fun. So what's going on here? If we just uh, take those guys out, uh, we take a look at uh, the Pro-Q. Again, it's cutting out the lows below 180. It's giving a nice push uh, with the high shelf above 4,500 there. And uh, there is some automation that is happening on this right here. Um, giving it uh what's happening here yeah let's take a look at the inside the actual eq mapping so yeah the band one frequency is uh is increasing as we get to that so if we look at the eq we'll be able to see that shift happen just taking some additional low end out at that point in the song now it's going into a clipper. I just wanted to make it really loud. So I'm using hard clipping on that sound. If we go to one of the main areas where it comes in, we can see quite a bit of clipping that sound can take. Yeah. So that's what's going on with the clipper. Then we have a utility that is controlling just overall volume. And then we have a PsyQ. And you can see I'm pushing up the high end and then I'm giving a 2 dB boost to 1.5. Nothing on the low end and that's it. So here's without the EQ. And with. Yeah, just giving it some color. So there we go. That's what we have. And then we have this main synth. So this comes in in the very first breakdown. This is a, an Omnisphere render. And uh, let's take the effects off it. Let me show you what's going on here. So let's listen to it. Yeah, what's this EQ doing? There we go. EQ, you can see this is kind of common for me to do on a lot of the mid-range elements. I'm just getting rid of low end uh, here and I'm getting rid of some low mid under 500. I'm giving it a little bit of a bell attenuation um, at this particularly resonant area of the, of the synth patch. And then I'm knocking out some high end. Okay. So here's without the EQ. That's the area where I was hearing kind of an annoying resonance. So I uh, used the, the uh, bell here in dynamic mode to be able to attenuate that a little bit. Okay, then we're running it into an Ableton saturator, medium curve, very simple.
orange clip again. And in this case, I'm not using hard clipping. I'm using the orange setting that it loads at by default, which is the negative 4.4 knee. And I'm giving some nice uh, soft clipping to that few dB. Yeah, right on. Okay, now we have a audio effect rack that is automating super plate. Okay, so let's take a look at super plate and let us take a look at where that automation is happening. So we can see it's happening all throughout this synth line. And when the synth first comes in in the breakdown, I want it to be extra lush. So I have super plate automated in at that point. And then as we move to the build, we get rid of that sense of lushness and space. It's getting smaller and smaller, leading to the drop where we pretty much almost get rid of it. And then we bring it back in. So it's doing this interplay, um, bringing the synth closer and further away from us uh, using super plate. And the algorithm we're using is the standard EMT 140. You can see it's got a four second, little north of four second decay. We're really um, band passing in the reverb because this reverb is in when the synth is summing with the big drums and the big 808. So we don't want a big, huge sounding reverb that's going to be muddy down below and, and potentially being masking towards our high frequencies up top. So I've really tamed it up. We're using a pretty big pre-delay and a little bit of modulation. So uh, let's listen with, uh, with that in. Yeah, so you get the idea. And then here where the drop is in, Okay, now we have another rack with a crystallizer and a super plate in it, and that's being automated to create a build. So let's take a look at where that is coming in. So that's coming in in the build section leading up to um, this drop right here. This is kind of the big main drop of the song when it first kicks in full scale. So uh, let's take a look at that and listen to this and listen to what it's doing. Yeah, yeah. So if we listen to that in solo, you can really hear what's going on. It's, it's getting bigger, it's getting bigger, it's getting bigger, and then it sucks right back down, sounding more dry. Yeah. So if we take a look at what is being automated, we can see the mix of the crystallizer, the output gain, the low cut and the regenerate is all being um, is all being automated, and I think on the front panel they've called this recycle. But if you look at the parameters down here, it actually says regenerate. Um, but it it'll it makes sense, right? It's just uh, kind of like a it's it's feeding the delayed signal or the the decaying signal back in and and regenerating it for longer, recycling the signal, and. Um, yeah, and then in Superplate, we have the mix is being automated, and uh, that is that. Okay, so let's play this again. You can watch the parameters move and see, see what's going on here. Nice. So I use these effects a lot, um, delays or delay-like effects and reverbs, to create a sensation of uh, of a build without, again, using kind of cheesy risers and and stuff like that. Maybe, depending on the genre, maybe risers work great for you, but I, a lot of times, don't really love them for my music. Okay, and then this last one is a, a plugin, sound choice plugin that we have not yet seen, and it's called Phase Mistress. Yeah, all right. So uh, this is in a static position. It's not being automated. And uh, we have basically it is just creating. Um, it's, it says it's an analog phase shifter, so it's making the synth sound a little bit more fuzzy 
a little bit more modulated. And uh, again, let's just listen to this and I'll, I'll play with the mix so you can really hear what it sounds like when it's jacked up. So it kind of has like a like a flanger or um, phaser moving modulated feel to it, uh, which which I really like. Yeah, sounds good on this sound. So that is this particular synth. Let's move to the next one, which shows up in the following breakdown. Yeah, it's another Omnisphere render. Let's take a look at the uh, effects that are going on here. So the first one is. We have the Echo Boy, the Echo Boy Jr. Just a little bit of rhythmic delay. This is an eighth note delay. Uh, we're cutting down some of the high content. We're using the studio tape uh, type. A little bit of mix, a little bit of feedback, really just adding in uh, a sense of, of space around it using the delay. Then we have our little friend, the PsyQ. And the PsyQ is doing a nice um, mid boost here at 1K, 4 dB up, and that is it. Just bringing out a bit of the pluck from the synth. And then we have a utility pushing up the volume and we have it reducing the width. So I wanted this sound to be a little bit more narrow in this section of the tune so it's not uh, a super wide breakdown a lot of times in the drops i want those to feel a bit more wide and girthy when they come in and then we have some returns going on you can see the early reflections b which is the larger sounding space we have the push plate which is going out to the super plate sound choice super plate so it's giving it some nice lushness with the reverb and then we have that thicken and widen that's going to the micro shift sound choice plugin nice okay and then uh it shifts to this synth which is a stack of two individual sounds together that have been rendered yeah let's kind of pick that apart see what's going on here first up is a pro q3 Doing some shaping, removing low end, giving a nice dynamic bump up there to the uh, low mids, taking out some of this kind of like picky pluckiness that's in that top part. Taking out some very high end. So yeah, here's without the EQ. With it. Nice. Using the PsyQ again for some color EQ and giving quite a bit of high end uh, boost to it to bring out some presence. And then we are not doing anything else. That's it. And a little bit of drive on the output. Nice. Oh, and I enabled all these other plugins, didn't mean to. Okay, so uh, we have a clipper. Next, orange clip. Very familiar at this point. Soft clipping. Let's see what's going on here. Here's with it off. And on. It's a very transient sound. You know, I don't... One of the... Speaking of things that I don't often clip... Things that are really sustained and at an even level. So if you have a long sustained sub bass, probably wouldn't clip that. If you have a long sustained pad or keys that are kind of like not staccato-y, if they're like a long sustained keys, might not clip those. I might uh, use some compression or I might use a little bit of gentle limiting on them if I need to control dynamic range. But because this is a very clicky percussive sound, I'm going to knock some peak level off of it. Okay. Yeah. And then next we have super plate. It's in a rack so I can automate it very easily. And I'm just controlling the width. And so you can see this sound continues um, into the final drop. So I want 
a sense of bigger lushness around it in the build, but not once the track drops because I don't want the reverb muddying things up. Okay, so let's listen to it in the full mix, looking at the automation. Yeah, so it drops that big lush reverb tail out uh, as soon as the drop comes in. So then we have early reflections B. Yeah, we have the ambience in there, which is that uh, small, deep ambience from FabFilter Pro R2. That's what's going on. Okay, Grand Piano. This is uh, just, I think the, can't remember what Grand Piano I used for this. Uh, maybe the Sonic Tech. And uh, I rendered this to audio. And this is just kind of, playing along with and holding out um, the back of the mix. It's deeper in the mix than the other synth, so they interplay nicely with each other. And there's actually that bass that's down there too, right? This one comes in in the breakdown, so they all work together here. So the piano's playing the same line as the, as the bass, and it's got um, some reverb on it, the push plate, uh, just to yeah give it a nice sense of setting it back in the mix is what's going on. And really, the only effect on here is uh, EQ. There's the EQ. This is also why it sounds really small. I'm pushing this to the back of the mix, not just with the reverb, but also with the frequency balance in here. So I'm just getting rid of all the high end, all the low end, really tightly band passing it in. You know, hear how dominating that is in the mix when you don't do that. And then we really, really small it up here. And it just tucks in nicely underneath the other elements that way. Okay, great. And then the last thing in the synth area is this breakdown synth splash, okay? And when we get to the breakdown, I wanted something on the one that was going to help the energy to diminish. Because sometimes when you move to a breakdown from a big section of the tune, you lose energy too quickly and all of a sudden things sound way too sparse. And it's like a really abrupt, hard transition energy-wise in the mix. And uh, this is helping with that. So it hits... As soon as you can see, it's on the breakdown, on the breakdown, and then in the build, in the build. And this is what it's doing. Right, so the sound actually has quite a bit of low end in it. It's got a, a big sense of lushness and space and reverb to it. And uh, if I take it out and we listen to the, the breakdown, you'll, you'll miss it, right? So it just kind of feels dry there and it feels like, oh, uh, you know, it was a hard transition. We put that in. And because it diminuendos over time, it kind of eases and, and drops the energy down for the breakdown. Yeah, so, so I like this. Uh, let's go ahead and I'll leave that utility on because it's controlling our volume. And let's take a look at uh, what is happening. Similar to the piano, it, it's getting smalled up. You know, I have a low shelf and that's when you want something to sound further away from you. You remove level, you remove high frequencies. You maybe add a little bit of low frequencies, low mids and add some reverb to it. And that'll push the whole sound back in the mix. That's one of the ways of doing it anyways. So yeah, here it is. Yeah, so the EQ is completely necessary. It's really smalling that sound up so that it sits amongst everything else. Yeah, there we go. Okay, uh, we have the phase mistress again. And uh, yeah, for it, this also helps in feeling uh, the sound is a little bit less distinct. When I, when I have something that I want to blur into the background a little bit, the phase mistress is, is great for that. So here we go. 
Here's without it. You can really hear it working. Yeah, and this is a preset called Two Stage Classic. Um, again, I was working quick and dirty with these effects, and they allowed me to get results really quickly because I just went to presets, found something that I liked, and in some cases tweaked it from there. Okay, little Alter Boy. Monophonic voice manipulation. Okay, let's check out what this is doing. So I'm dropping it down. You can see pitch and formant are down a full octave, right? I'm using a fair bit of mix. I'm using a little bit of drive. Mm -hmm. I just wanted that sound to be lower in the mix than, than everything else at this point. So definitely like what that's doing. And then we have super plate coming in. And again, because this is a, a, a big impact kind of sound that's on the one on the one of the breakdown uh i think this is the biggest uh of the reverbs that i use huge 16 second uh, decay time i'm using the audi audicon um uh plate style and uh a lot of mix right so yeah here's without here's with yeah it's big actually listen to that now let's listen to it in the mix of it Yeah, let's back that off just to just a touch. And then we're using the filters. I always use these filters because I'm I'm trying to tuck the reverb in and small it up, right? So it's not dominating with everything else. Okay. And uh, now we have a DMG track limit on the transparent setting, which will be very slow. And uh, yeah, I think maybe I was getting a bit of distortion on it and just wanting this to be very gentle. Yeah, so it's helping to to kind of reduce the dynamic range of it so that I can have the tail, the decaying tail, quite a bit louder. And uh, I can take the, the punch off the front of it, uh, quite a bit of levels being cut with that uh, limiter. And then our friend the tremolator is pulsing it again. And it's critical that this is after the reverb because the reverb is the really huge long tail, right? And this is just pumping it, giving it a nice rhythmic effect of the decay of the reverb because it's so huge, right? Okay. And then I'm just using a, I call this a rack basic Haas. And it's a, a rack that I just built where uh, one of the sides is, of the delay is being uh, delayed by 12 milliseconds. So it's creating a a Haas effect. There's no feedback, and uh, the left and the right channel are beating the same thing, but one of them is delayed. So that's going to create a very, very wide um, sounding Haas effect. Without. It's kind of in the mid, you know? I, I wanted to spread this out to make room for other things because there's that, remember, there's that 808 that comes in here. Yeah, so that Haas effect gets it to play nice. Right on. Okay, and then all of those um, synths are going up into the uh, mid instruments. Nothing's running through these. Normally it would if the project had these types of things. If I had like lots of pianos and strings and stuff, they might be going to instruments. If I had pads, they might be going to background synths. If there was a synth lead in here, it might be going there. But in this case, the synth structure for the mid-range synths was much more simple. So I just sent them all to the all mid instruments. And uh, yeah, it's pretty simple what's in here. It's just an EQ and a limiter. Okay, so the EQ is knocking out low end, giving them a bit of uh, high end up top from 2500 and up. You can see there there was a ton of low end there that was uh, needing to be cut. So that's when I will use a, a high pass filter is to really aggressively cut stuff like that. No no issues with using a high pass filter there. And then we have level being knocked off with track limit. Yeah. Okay, we are almost there. This has been a marathon session. I I I had. Uh, not anticipated um, we would be this long on the video, but I told you I would leave no stone unturned and I'm going through everything as thoroughly as I can so you get the full process, okay?
Now, uh, this sound it was just a special effect that I added. Okay, this is um, actually a field recording of me on my paddleboard paddling through the water on a lake. And I thought the, the original sound was uh, pretty interesting. And uh, I always like using little snippets of um, real world audio in songs. So here, here's what the raw thing sounded like. Oh, it's running through a return. Yeah, so it's just literally, I recorded that with my iPhone, me paddling out on the lake. Um, and I've always wanted to use it in a song. Yeah, there we are. So that's going to super plate, the uh, push plate, right? And then I have filter freak on here. Yeah. And it's really smalling things up. One thing I did want to mention about filter freak is it can run in parallel, the filters in parallel or in serial, okay? So if it's in parallel, it's gonna sound really different. Right, so, so one of the chains is getting high pass filtered and then the other chain is getting low pass filtered, but um, they're not one after the other like in series, right? So you get this kind of full range sounding signal. And in this case, I wanted to band pass the signal. And in most cases, this is how I'm using Filter Freak. So I'm actually running it in series, okay? So now you get the band passed feel. Yeah, there we go. Really smalls it up. Okay, and uh, then we have uh, PsyQ. And PsyQ is um, pushing up a ton of high end on that um, here. And then it's also, uh, no, it's not doing anything else. It's just adding high end in. And it is also um, turning down the, uh, the output quite radically. Just some macro moves there. Okay. And then we have a limiter on it afterwards in the transparent uh, style. Yeah, just taking the initial front, really attenuating it, letting the body of the signal uh, come up in comparison. So there it is. Uh, where is the water sound running? It is going into submix for effects. Okay. Yeah. And speaking of effects, this is our last group. So. We have uh, just a, a simple collection here of a reverse effect and a white noise burst. So let's go through each one of these. Here is the reverse. Yeah. Right on. So if we look at this, literally as simple as it gets. There is no processing on that whatsoever. Just level. Okay. And uh, the white noise burst. I use white noise on... Uh, so much stuff, and I I prefer white noise too. Um, I prefer white noise to using cymbal crashes and stuff like that a lot. I just really like the effect of, especially um, kind of pumping white noise using an LFO or that tremolator. And uh, yeah, I'm using it at different volume levels. You can see here throughout the song, and the most prominent way it's being used is in the drop. But it sounds kind of obnoxious without the processing, right? So the processing really makes a difference. So let's dig under the hood, see what's going on for processing. Okay, we have a Pro-Q3 just knocking all the low mids and lows out of this 840 hertz and below. And then uh, we have our new gen audio um, going on here. I think I was experimenting with this, but it's... Everything's as narrow as it gets. So um, I don't think I ended up doing anything with that. So I'm going to go ahead and just delete that. And then now we have a chain of uh, sound choice. Okay, so I'm just going to turn off what we have here. First one is super plate. And uh, you can see uh, a lot of times I'm just adding effects and I'm putting effects into a rack. I'm either using the sound toys uh, effect rack or I'm using the Ableton Live um, effect rack. I use the Ableton Live one a lot because it gives me range control over what parameters are being controlled by the macro. And that gives me a lot of really uh, finesse kind of level control over things, uh, which I really like. And I can also, I can, if I want to, if I just automate the macro knob, I can add effects if I want later after automating the knob 
and then I can just map parameters to that knob and then all of a sudden they move with everything else. So it's quite flexible. Take a look here at what's going on. You can see, yeah, what this is doing is it's controlling filtering on this. So I'm wanting the top end of the signal to kind of slowly decline as the white noise progresses through that phrase. And uh, that's what that's doing. So let's just take a look at uh, Superplate. Okay, so we've got Superplate on here. And eight seconds, I'm using the Stocktronics uh, plate style there. And um, I'm cutting up, uh, cutting out some super highs and then using quite a bit of mix. So it's a big reverb, right? Yeah, there we go. Using micro shift. This is going to be giving it some nice thickness and width. So it just helps it be less mono in the top end. You can really hear that. That brings it right into the center when I bypass it, and then it spreads it out in the top end when I enable it. Then we have, this is the key thing, is the white noise I found, it was, yeah, quite quite obnoxious when it was just consistent like that, and with a lot of these effects that are that are extending over a longer period of time, I want them to be rhythmically pumping. So, yeah, love the tremolator for that. There we go. And then also key to the sound is Filter Freak. So we have Filter Freak happening. We have the uh, predictable um, low pass and high pass filters. But in this case, I'm using it in parallel and not series. Okay. So here's what it sounds like if I had it in series. But I'm not doing that. I'm running it in parallel. Yeah, so it's taking the high frequencies out as the whole thing uh, descends. And yeah, it just gives us a nice, nice feel to the whole track. Let's listen to it pop in there. Yeah. Nice. And then that's being sent out to the push plate as well and to the thicken and widen, which is the micro shift as well. So just a couple of the returns are going on there. And then this is going up to the HF ducking group. So we've covered all of the individual sounds. We've covered what's going on in the submixes. And I told you, I promised you that I would come and discuss what I'm doing for ducking. So we'll hop into that next. So all of the ducking is happening by routing the various other submixes up into one of three ducking groups okay so we have hard ducking soft ducking and hf or high frequency ducking and um, occasionally i will bypass the ducking network of submixes here with a sound if i don't want to duck it um, for example if there's a lead vocal uh, you probably don't want to duck your lead vocal to the drums right but almost everything else you want to get ducked to the drums. Another possible exception would be if there was a lead instrument, like a, a lead synth or uh, like a, a horn, like a trumpet or a saxophone, something like that, that you really want that melody and message to come through. And so you wouldn't want the drums to be stepping on that. But you do have to be really careful because if that type of instrument is loud in the mix and it's summing with the drums, then that can really start to mess with your mastering chain, pushing really high level into things. So you do have to watch that. And that's why I have these um, different groups here for the ducking. So hard ducking, what is that? That is for things like bass and uh, synths and background elements where I just want them almost completely or completely out of the way of the kick and the snare. Okay. Soft ducking is for elements that that is too heavy handed for. So sometimes you have synth elements and things like that where if you route them to hard ducking and you're you're knocking them completely out of the way then you really hear that you're missing it especially in the mid-range and the high frequencies of those elements and they can sound uh you know the drums are clear but the rest of the song actually starts to suffer and uh, i hear this in a lot of music actually that goes over the top with sidechain ducking and compression and stuff like that so i have a soft ducking submix for things that I want to be a little bit more gentle and controlled with, I might be doing the ducking in a multiband fashion 
and controlling wet dry on each band so I can just get it so there's enough space for the drums to punch through and attenuate everything else, but I'm not completely sucking out the energy in the elements that are getting ducked. Okay? And then there's HF ducking. That's one that I added more recently to my template because I was finding that specifically effects like white noise up top and crashes and anything that was like had a lot of really high frequencies. I was finding that I wanted almost no ducking at all on the top top frequencies because it's the most noticeable up there. So I would have like a white noise splash. And if I had some kick ducking, even fairly gently going on in the top of it, I would just really, it's like just pulling it around all over the place. And it, and it sounds, especially because I write broken beat stuff. Um, I'm not doing four on the floor house music, which it might sound more rhythmic with, but the, because the kick and the snares are, are playing this broken beat pattern, uh, I found it was really distracting on the top end. So I created this HF ducking uh, submix specifically to route noise through and, and other high frequency elements. Okay, so let's go and take a look at the ducking setup and, and what am I actually doing here? So hard ducking, yeah, it's most of the things are, that aren't drums are running through hard ducking, okay? So let's just solo that up so you can hear actually what's running through that group. So definitely you can hear all the returns in there. So all the returns, because there's a lot of lush, long reverbs and delays and stuff like that in the returns group, they are all coming in to the all return submix. And then that all return submix is going out into hard ducking. And that is how you have a lush, big sounding track where it's not masking your drums and causing your whole mix to sound kind of muddy and washed out. You can, you can have both, right? You don't have to make a compromise. So I love that capturing all the returns and then routing those into hard ducking. Then you can hear the 808s are being captured into that and then the other kind of bass oriented uh, synths. But if we come in and we listen to a section in here where there's other synths, we're hearing the main synths are also coming into hard ducking. Okay, so uh, what's going on here? If we take a look, we have three of these devious machines duck devices. So this is the only device that I'm using. I'm not using sidechain compression. It's, um, it's just not controllable enough. It distorts, it creates artifacts. Um, so really I've gotten used to using these enveloping tools of the ones that I've tried. Uh, this is definitely head and shoulders above the rest. I like the features that it has and I'll show you why. So the first one is ducking to the kick and I use different envelopes for each one of my main types of drums that I need to route through this. So you can see the sidechain input, I'm routing in from the kick track. Okay, so that's key. You need to route an audio sidechain in. And then you need to go trigger mode, triggering off the sidechain input. I use one millisecond of look ahead so that it won't click very much. Just a tiny bit of look ahead, not more than that. One millisecond I find is, is enough. And then I use a little touch of smoothing and that just helps it to not pop and click. If you're having it pop and click on you, play with the smoothing a little bit, play with the look ahead a little bit, but don't use like 15 seconds of look ahead because what it's going to do is attenuate your, your signal way before the drum actually comes in and it's going to sound weird. Okay. I really had to learn this plugin. I had to play with a lot of these settings to, to get this right. Um, you have all these like pre-done um, envelopes. I, I don't use those. I enable this function right here where you actually see the audio input. So that's going to show me the kick. That's the kick we're looking at. Okay. Let me uh, enable the kick at the same time so we can hear and see it. Okay, and I've set the speed to 116, and then I've just drawn in these breakpoints and curves to the point where it's completely nullifying it when the kick is at high energy at max amplitude. And then as soon as the kick starts to decay, I curve it back in, and then there's this little decay tail to the kick. And I just kind of finesse it up like that. That's how I do the shape. And then I've saved this as Vesper's kick hard duck. And then I play with this and I change the envelope for every song because I use different types of kicks, right? Different lengths of kicks. Now it also has multiband. And you can see here, I'm ducking the low band 100% below 120 hertz. Okay, so it's just completely ducking it. And then the high band, I've, I've rolled that back quite a bit because this has synths and other things in it. And I don't want the synths to be completely dodging out of the way because, again, it's noticeable and it kind of sounds rubbish to me. Now, normally for hard ducking, 
if it was like a drum and bass track or like a glitch hop track, I'd be at 100%. This is wet dry globally for the whole plugin. But in this case, um, I decided not to because uh, it's, it just sounded, uh, I don't know, I liked the sound of the kick pushing into the 808 and then hitting the mastering chain. I liked that. It just gave it a little bit of extra crunch and oomph. Um, a lot of people might try and go 100% here because they like want maximum cleanliness, but it didn't serve the song. It didn't serve the genre. And I try not to do things just on autopilot. I listen and I'm like, in this case, I wanted the kick to sum with the 808 and have it be the perception of a single thing. The kick was the punchy transient part of the sound. And then there was the bassy ring that came afterwards. That's how an 808 usually works. And I used a separate kick. So this was a, one of the ways that I enabled them to kind of sound more cohesive together is not completely ducking uh, to the kick. Yeah. So, so this is how I set it up. That's to the kick. Okay. Now these next two are for the uh, a snare and a clap. Okay. So I'm going to enable that group in the solos as well. So we're going to have kick. We're going to have snares and claps. Or ducking. So what's going on with this one? So this is going to reading from snares and claps, and then that's a drum rack that's on there. So it has a whole bunch of drums in it. And then I can use the sub chooser menu and I'm choosing, this is main snare. Okay, so is the main snare in here? It is, but uh, let's go to a section where it's uh, more snare, less clap. So what is it doing here? Everything else is the same. Okay, trigger mode is sidechain input. One millisecond look ahead, little tiny bit of smoothing. Okay, and uh, you can see boom. So you can see the snare being very, very clipped, very loud. You can see, uh, again, I'm using one eighth speed. You can, you can change that, right? If you need to change the resolution of the display. Okay. And uh, you can see here's the, here's the bass coming through. And uh, I'm just knocking it all the way out and then enveloping it up a little uh, in a different way, right? So I can, I can finesse the envelope for each of the main drums that I'm ducking to, okay? And in this case, uh, I'm doing a little bit more in the high end. Again, the crossover here now is at 150. And uh, I'm doing 75% wet on the device. Okay. Now this final one is for a clap, the main clap. So if we go here, you see snares and claps is the main uh, area it's choosing from. And then we're seeing main clap from the sub chooser. And again, trigger mode side chain, one millisecond look ahead, a little bit of smoothing, 75% wet. And again, very similar to the snare, but a different envelope here. And again, you have to, press this to view the side chain and you can see it and you envelope them together so you get a perfect kind of envelope between the drum and the bass so it's not ducking more than it needs to uh, and you're not getting bow tying right okay so if i disable these this is what it sounds like without kind of muddy right uh, it, it's smashing the mastering chain um a, a lot more it doesn't sound clear right here's with nice okay so um soft ducking if we go soft ducking so that's uh one of the synths that's running through that so if we go here, that synth starts in the break. So that synth wash and then that, that lead synth are happening in there. And really, we're not going to worry about it until it gets to the drop where the drums are. So let's go ahead and uh, solo up the kick and the snares and claps with that.
Okay, so we have basically I copied the all of the duck instances from the hard ducking group, but then I was able to just change them and be less heavy handed. I was able to back off the amount of high, for example. I was able to change the envelope if I needed to. I don't think I did. And then I was able to just back off the wet dry so that uh, the kick, I think I left it a bit more aggressive. But with the snares, um, you can see I'm at 50% wet instead of 75 or 80. So I'm not moving it out of the way of the snares as much because the snares were making it sound uh, too hard ducked, right? So there we go. That is the soft ducking group. So just layers of control. You have the ability to, to tailor uh, and route sounds flexibly between a couple of these groups. And then we have, uh, last but not least, we have the HF ducking, and that is going to have the white noise going through it. Okay, and uh, what I chose to do here is just have the kick ducking this. I wasn't concerned about the snares um, being masky with this because the snares were just making it sound too chopped up. Didn't sound good to me. So I've just used the kick and you can see the, the high. I'm using the multiband, right? You can turn multiband on and off here. And I use the high all the way at zero. So the high end isn't being touched at all. The kick from 120 and below is ducking it. And then it's at 75% wet, okay? So that is just clearing some space. And there we go. Okay, and then all of the um, hard ducking, everything routes through the mix bus. And the reasoning for this is if I want to record like this and just print my mix in the session without exporting it out of the master, I can do that, okay? And um, all that's happening here, none of these effects are being used. I use these sometimes to do little pushes um, in a chorus or a drop or something, but I'm not using them. Uh, I'm knocking quite a bit of level off because everything, once it started summing up, um, it got very loud because as I mix, I push things louder, this thing louder, that thing louder, this thing louder, that thing louder. And eventually you get to the point where you'd be clipping out your master. So I'm just gain staging everything down before it hits the master track. And in this case, the master track uh, in Ableton Live, they started calling it main, uh, you know, just to make things confusing for us. And uh, on the master, I'll show you real quick what I have on the master. Okay. These, uh, these effects are just uh, metering plugins. Okay. These are like a oscilloscope and uh, Voxengo span, which I showed you earlier to show you that there was some width in the low end of the song. Um, and then, yeah, here I'm pushing into just, this is not my real mastering chain. This is like a little quick test master just to, just to see what it uh, is going to sound like going through some gain reduction. Really, there's been so much gain reduction and control over the dynamics in the song up until this point that I don't really need much on the master. We're just going to be kind of, uh, Clipping a bit. I think gold clip is actually working pretty hard. I, I don't normally put gold clip into the soft clipper mode like this, but I have it in soft clipped right now. Um, so yeah, let's listen to a drop and see what's going on in, uh, in gold clip. So, I mean, yeah, that's a decent amount of clipping on the master, but it sounds, sounds okay to me. Sounds good to me. And it's really only where those big bass synths all come in together. That's the section where it was just overloading a little bit. If we look in the, kind of the first drop where it's less things in the mix, it's not touching the clipper as much. And that's usually how I set up my clipper if I'm running a clipper on the master, is I set it so it's just shaving off the odd little over, the odd little peak. Uh, that happens at that summing point. You know, it might be one clap that comes in and it just gives 2 dB over. I'm just absorbing that into the clipper so that the mastering limiter is uh, is not having to contend with um, with those little variations in level. And I can set the mastering limiter more at kind of like a good average level. And then, yeah, in terms of the mastering limiter, um, I don't know if I'm going to stick with FabFilter Pro L2. Um, I just threw it on for, for doing this. I'm using the modern um, uh, style. I'm using... 20 uh, milliseconds of look ahead or sorry 0.2 uh, milliseconds of look ahead just a tiny little bit so it's not going to distort just allows it to see transients coming and uh yeah I'm, I'm not i'm not running this song super loud right So 
So we're not even hitting two decibels of gain reduction on, on the limiter, partially because the clipper is absorbing some of that and partially because I'm just not pushing this song too loud. And um, when I went and listened to the references, now these are, these are big reference songs. These are, are really, really popular, really well done songs. None of these songs, except for Skrillex and Mr. Carmack, are, are pushed really loud. The, the actual hip hop songs, um, Mr. Carmack, I would call that trap and Skrillex is, uh, that's a bass music song. But the, the trend in hip hop has not been to go super loud, like negative six luffs, like the Skrillex song or the Carmack song. And uh, there's a big reason for that. And that's because 808s don't sound good when you limit the living daylights out of them. They lose their their big fullness. Um, it's not just that; like it is possible to to limit and compress 808s. But uh, the other thing is is that with hip hop, it tends to have uh, it needs a lot of level in the bass, and it is um, difficult to have a track be really loud without starting to sacrifice the bass because the bass frequencies are the ones that are taking up the most amount of amplitude and headroom in the mix. So as soon as you start pushing your mix really loud, you end up limiting and pushing down uh, the sub frequencies the most. And so hip hop, uh, really the reason why these top engineers are, are mastering their hip hop songs to like negative nine luffs, that's about as loud as the Gambino and Suicide Boys track are. Um, they're not negative eight, negative seven, negative six. They're like negative nine. So um, it's giving the 808 a lot of energy to breathe and sound big. And I like that. Okay, so that's why I've kind of set up the mastering chain like this. Again, I'm not mastering this. It's just quick and dirty master. And uh, there we are. Marathon complete. I think that I have gone and dug into every little aspect of that mix. And I hope you enjoyed it. Congratulations, you made it. I hope you got a lot out of that deep dive video. There was a ton of stuff to go through and I really just wanted to give you the goods. Again, I didn't hold anything back. I walked you through exactly how I do everything in my current workflow. And I really hope you, you got a lot out of that one. Drop me a comment below the video. Let me know what you thought. Let me know if you need me to clarify anything. I'll do my best to respond. Uh, if there's any other questions around audio production you have, drop them down there. Future videos, other topics that you wanna see. I love to hear from you guys. Give the video a thumbs up, please, if you liked it. Subscribe to the channel if you are not already. And uh, where to go next? Yeah, so I have a whole playlist on mixing and mastering. I have just tons of videos like this one and on other related subjects. So I'll drop a link in the cards and below the video and keep learning and follow that playlist. Right on, I'll catch you in the next video. Take care.